So thank you so much. So thank you so much for having me here. Uh, thank you for the organization of this, uh, of this workshop, very interesting. And uh, so I hope, so also thanks for the one that are here, the very last talk of the session. Uh, we try not to be so long, uh, that so you have time to, to rest uh, also before the poster session. And uh, so also I'm lucky because actually uh, I'm, I work in the very same group as Nicola Trepp. So Nicola already introduced many different uh, concepts. So the physical concept has already been introduced. So. Uh, I will go through uh, uh, again uh, some of them in order to be sure that the context is clear on what you're, I'm going to speak about, but I will speak about uh, some different things. Uh, so yes, uh, today I'm, I'm going to speak about non-Gaussian quantum complex network. Uh, so here I have a pre-COVID picture, which is merged with uh, two uh, more pictures of people arriving during the COVID time. So this kind of emerging uh, uh, scale of what has been uh, shown but, uh, by, by Nicola. And uh, so uh, here are the outline of my talk. Uh, so I will go through briefly the quantum complex network. So again, uh, this is mainly my picture uh, in which I'm working now. And uh, But you will see that the physical concepts are really the same that Nicola has been uh, speaking about. And, and then I will concentrate more on the non-Gaussian part of, of uh, what uh, I'm doing, so which is the non-Gaussian cluster. And in particular, so I, I, will, I will go through uh, the detection of ring negativity in a multimode cluster. So this is in a way also kind of a, uh, one of the possible answer uh, to a question that Nicola had in the previous talk, uh, how you can uh, characterize multimode uh, non-Gaussian states uh, in a more efficient way. And then uh, I will go to uh, benchmarking of complex uh, of non-Gaussian cluster via uh, complex network theory. So here uh, it's a more theoretical problem. So when you can even go in the regime uh, where, uh, I mean, uh, let's say experiment is not uh, yet there actually in the sense that you can have a large cluster with a lot of uh, different non-Gaussian operation. Uh, how you can characterize this kind of states? Uh, uh, it's it's not it's not easy to benchmark. And then, well, one answer could be that we can use uh, uh, complex network tools uh, for doing it. Uh, so very good. Uh, so let's start. So probably uh, you already have seen this picture from the one that uh, have had one of my talk uh, in the last let's say two three years. So uh, I'm really interested now about complex networks. So when I speak about networks, what I have in mind uh, is the picture of network theory. So uh, complex network, any, any kind of object in which you can uh, see nodes and links, uh, and which is uh, something in between uh, being a regular network, in the sense that you have a deterministic rule uh, for building it, and a random one, uh, meaning that you have maybe no rule and it's totally probabilistic. So everything which is in between the two uh, can be uh, considered as complex networks. And complex network models are very interesting because they can describe real world networks. So many different kinds of networks, social network, metabolic reaction, and of course, internet is a complex network that can be described as some of the complex network models that has been established. Uh, so they're classified via statistical property, uh, probability distribution, for example, of number of links is the, uh, one of the main, so what is called the degree, which is often, uh, often given. And uh, from this property, you can have, you can characterize uh, an emergent behavior, uh, like the small world community structure, and corresponding functionalities to this nectar. So you can have nectar that are more or less, uh, 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 for example, resilient to, uh, to attack, for example. Uh, very good. So the idea is to go quantum, uh, meaning that, uh, again, uh, so you have uh, object with node and links, but here nodes are quantum system. And link could be physical interaction or, for example, any kind of uh, uh, quantum correlation, like, for example, entanglement links. So uh, these structures are interesting for me uh, because can be used to uh, simulate behavior of complex or, uh, and or quantum natural phenomena. And of course, they can be used to simulate a kind of complex network structures you want to use in quantum communication and quantum information protocols. Uh, so, the, uh, so the idea is that uh, to, to there to develop theory and experiments uh, for a continuous viable quantum complex network and, and, and the kind of network that they have in mind, uh, so are uh, the one in which nodes, again, are uh, uh, multi-modes, uh, so uh, different uh, frequency temporal modes. Uh, 
um, like the one that Nicola has been shown before, and um, uh, and the kind of link are links that uh, involve continuous variables. So uh, I mean, it could be uh, again physical interaction or uh, uh, quantum correlation, but we work in the continuous variable regime, so we are really interested about the continuous variable with different these different rules. Um, so of course, uh, there is a quite typical kind of quantum network that has been evoked many times uh, during this uh, workshop already, which are cluster states, so in particular, continuous variable cluster state. And uh, of course, actually, the graphical structure of a network is very important for cluster states. So you have an attention matrix that describes them, uh, that uh, gives you where actually you apply the CZ operation that builds uh, the, uh, the cluster state. Uh, has have been shown, so these classes state can be approximated uh, experimentally uh, by, uh, by using a squeeze state uh, and, and linear optics. So the, uh, the basic, uh, uh, let's say, uh, part of the network, if you just to take two, uh, uh, the basic building blocks, so if you just take two nodes and one link, uh, well, this can be just build, built uh, with two, two, modes, uh, two squeeze state that uh, goes into a bin splitter. Or in an equivalent way, it can be built in a, a non-degenerate parametric process, which is more or less the picture that we have we have in mind in our uh, in our group. Uh, so, if you have a parametric process with signal light, you can directly get uh, 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 towards uh, squid state, uh, which is uh, mainly the basic building block of the cluster state. Uh, of course, to build the larger class state, uh, so the idea that you have many different squeeze modes uh, that can undergo on different uh, uh, linear optic interaction, which are the one that uh, uh, choose, let's say, the shape of the of the class that you get at the end. And this again can be recast uh, uh, on multi-mode parametric non-conversion process, uh, meaning that we have a multicolor process because we have uh, uh, optical frequency cones, so we have many frequency entering the process. And uh, the shape in this case, so the part of the linear optics is done by uh, the measurement basis. So this is, uh, I'm just uh, recalling what Nicolas uh, has told uh, from a different point of view, a different picture, but is uh, really exactly the same. So, uh, and uh, uh, what is very interesting uh, in our case is that uh, is, uh, as Nicolas told, it's quite easy uh, to, to reshape the network because maybe uh, you can do it by just choosing, choosing the measurement base it's, uh, in a, in a multimodal modal detection. And uh, uh, it's not the only one thing that you can do. So one, uh, so this, this, I mean, the, the measurement basis uh, uh, for choosing the, uh, the shape is what I call the linear process for choosing the basis that you can have a linear process if you want it is uh, by changing the spectral shape of the, uh, of the pump uh, of your process that can, uh, can give you another degree of freedom in order to manipulate uh, these, uh, these states. So uh, this again uh, is what Nicola uh, have shown in the uh, in, uh, before in the experiment that we were speaking about. A different cluster state has been generated, and you can see that I mean you, we can generate different shape uh, uh, and with a number of nodes that goes up to twelve uh, for the moment uh, in Bobadit experiment. And uh, so Nicola was showing a video of the experiment that put in picture of people that did the experiment. Again, you have pre-COVID and post and during COVID picture of people uh, making, <laughs> making stuff in the lab. Uh, of course, also as has been evocated actually, uh, so we're not the only one um, in cluster state. And of course there are experiments that go uh, for larger uh, states, uh, especially uh, the one of Ulrich and the one of Akira. I think he's also going to speak uh, later on. And, uh, and actually, we are not at the same point. So of course, here you have kind of clusters that involve a million of nodes uh, with also very particular structure that uh, allow for uh, measurement based quantum computing. Um, so the point is that uh, I, I want to profit of the fact that we can really, I want to exploit the fact we can really shape uh, the uh, the, um, the cluster uh, uh, easily in order to go uh, towards cluster shape, uh, uh, complex shape of the cluster. And then I will go through why I think it is interesting. 
but of course, when you start to speak about complex nature, with complex nature people, well, they say, well, okay, if you have 20, or you can understand, if you have 20 modes, uh, well, you can arrange as you want, but it's not so complex the shape that you can get from it. So, of course, uh, even for us, uh, the idea is that it would be nice to have a larger uh, cluster state. And actually, uh, there is uh, one, uh, one, one more experiment that we have in the lab that is going through a larger number of modes. So the idea here is that we want to exploit uh, both the uh, spectral degree of freedom, so the spectral shape of our modes, but also include a kind of time beam configuration that corresponds to the pulses uh, of our femtosecond uh, laser. So uh, the idea is that we, uh, we go through a single pass, uh, uh, squeezing uh, configuration. So we uh, have no more the cavity around uh, the experiment. So, uh, and uh, we consider periodically pulled uh, waveguides uh, uh, in order to, to increase the interaction and still keeping uh, uh, large uh, value of squeezing and if the, the last I mean, most recent results uh, uh, doesn't give uh, a very much large squeezing but they're very preliminary results and uh, so the idea is that uh, in this system uh, what we can get is that uh, we have kind of uh, multiplexing of the degree of freedom because uh, at each pulse uh, we can have a squeezing on different several uh, spectral modes and so this uh, experiment has been done again with a femtosecond pulse laser source, uh, uh, which is uh, around 800 nanometers, so very near infrared, and with a repetition rate on 150 megahertz and uh, a pulse width of 40, uh, around 40 femtoseconds. So we have shorter, uh, shorter pulses, larger spectrum, uh, uh, spectrum length. So. And uh, so we uh, got some uh, preliminary results from this experiment. So here is this a single pass multimode squeezing. Uh, so you can see the experimental setup uh, with a, uh, so probably I can use pointer, yes. So here you can see uh, the, the experimental setup with a periodically pulled uh, chip. So you have uh, something like 30 wave, uh, 30 wave guides, not only a wave guide on this chip. Uh, and uh, you can see a picture here of, uh, of, the, of the chip, which is a little bit, uh, you have a zoom on the, on the picture. And uh, what we, uh, we got is that we can have a measurement of something like about 14 squeeze modes uh, with uh, 0 0.6 dB of squeezing. So it's not very large, uh, but we were able to measure these different uh, modes for each time beam. So at each pulse, we can measure uh, squeezing for the different, for this 14 uh, uh, different spectral uh, modes uh, of light. Um, so of course, what I'm showing here is uh, what you get on a spectrum analyzer. So you cannot really see the fact that we are uh, really sensitive to the uh, single time beam, so the single pulse. Uh, so the idea is that, uh, I guess I have to get out. Okay. Oh. Uh, to convince about the fact that we can really measure pulse by pulse. So uh, if you consider uh, a very uh, little portion of what we see in, in the spectrum analyzer for a given time that corresponds to, uh, uh, to squeezing, you can recover uh, what an oscilloscope can see at the output of our homodyne detector. And here you can see that, for example, in 50 microseconds, you can have something like uh, more than 7,000 pulses. So I can really zoom in in order to see that we can really distinguish between different pulses. So uh, you have uh, the, there the, uh, the, uh, the, the shape corresponding to, uh, to different uh, pulses on one photodiode of the homodyne detector, and then the homodyne signal uh, that corresponds to each pulses. And uh, so at the end of the day, we can recover uh, this kind of picture. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, synchronization of uh, the uh, uh, shape that we get while we are scanning the uh, the phase of the local oscillator on the spectrum analyzer on the lower part, on the upper part, you get uh, the uh, value of different uh, quadrature corresponding to different pulses. Uh, and we can recover exactly the same statistic that we can get directly from the spectrum analyzer in terms of, uh, of squeezing. So, 
uh, we are very happy with these uh, first uh, results. Of course, the idea is that we want to improve uh, the squeezing and the number of mode, the detection technique. Uh, uh, so we're still working on uh, our homodyne detector, which is a fast homodyne detector, so able to solve uh, 100 uh, so pulses with uh, six nanosecond uh, distances. Uh, so I just want to show the picture of the three person that did the work on uh, the experiment that uh, uh, got these uh, uh, first preliminary results. And also I want to mention that we have a new setup that is coming at Telecom Wavelength uh, uh, that more or less is going to use uh, the same kind of process in a, a, a single pass uh, configuration. And uh, if you want to uh, know a little bit more about the theory, how to engineer the waveguides uh, in this regime, uh, you can look today at the poster of uh, Victor that is going to present the post number 14, uh, which is a work actually in collaboration with Lipsis, actually uh, Victor worked in Lipsis and, and, and the people in, uh, in Paderborn. Uh, very good. Uh, so the uh, so what we hope for the future is to get uh, experimentally very uh, very large cluster that can be shaped uh, in a complex way. So the question is uh, why I'm interested in going to uh, uh, to complex uh, shape for cluster. Well, so there are many different things. One one the first is that it can be used for simulating structural quantum environments. So here, I'm, uh, let's say I'm cheating a little bit uh, because when I uh, when I show this kind of picture, what I have in mind are network of harmonic oscillator with spring-like coupling. So it's not exactly uh, cluster state, but they can be uh, uh, mapped on the very same experimental setup that we use for cluster state. So as far as you have caution uh, operation, you can find uh, a way of mapping uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the multi-mode state to the one that we have in the experiment. Uh, so of course, a different kind of environment when you couple different system uh, give us different way of, uh, I mean, different channel of dissipation that can be recast on what is called the spectral density environmental coupling. So the picture here shown, so the, the, uh, the line uh, is the uh, theoretical calculation on uh, given a particular shape of the environment, what is the spectral density environmental coupling. Uh, while the uh, different dots are simulation or what we can get from our experimental setup, meaning that we can really recover the same kind of, uh, uh, of effect uh, when we consider a bunch of mo or mode of light that are recast uh, in a complex environment, and then we cap uh, couple them on a quantum system, which is again for us an harmonic oscillator. Uh, so these are numerical simulation based on the experimental details of our experiments. So the experiment is still going on. So the real experiment uh, 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 is ongoing and, and, and Paul is, is, is working on getting the, the, the feature of this uh, complex environment uh, in the experimental setup. Um, a second point that is interesting uh, for going through a complex uh, cluster is that we can consider them as a way to test a uh, routing protocol. Uh, so, of course, the idea is to test routing protocol for continuous variable networks. Uh, so we have studied uh, so what we can get as a, a complex cluster in this regime, of course, uh, given the fact that normally you build graphs from experimental resource, so you have a certain distribution of, of squeezed mode of light, and then you use just linear optics in order to get uh, uh, the approximated cluster. Uh, and we have uh, found how to optimize them, uh, given the linear optics, uh, given the, the resource that we have. And also, we have go through kind of quantum routing protocol. So the idea here is that uh, in, in the multi-mode case, it's quite easy to get uh, a large cluster uh, with the shape that you want, and then you can distribute. And then you can rearrange, for example, you can distribute part of the network, the cluster, uh, to Alice and part to the pop, and then you want to rearrange your link. So for, for example, you just want to have a particular teleportation channel. And then the idea is to go uh, there by using the most simple operation that you can do in uh, uh, continuous variable quantum optics. So at first, you can just use linear optics operation uh, in order to solve this problem. So the idea is that you allow uh, Alice and Bob to just do a linear optics operation on this side in order to, uh, to go from this situation to the situation you have just one uh, possible channel. 
And so we have played a little bit with, B, with it by starting with just, uh, uh, I mean, a basic shape, not three really complex for, for the moment. And we have found condition or, um, numerically, uh, the condition where uh, we can get uh, this, uh, this game. So we have half of the cluster given to Alice, half of the cluster given to Bob, and uh, try to see if we can rearrange in order to get a particular EPR channel on two nodes. And it's not always possible, depending on the shape of the classes. So the, the, this graph that we call Y is different from the fully connected. Uh, and we also got some kind of uh, alternate configuration for a grid class. So if you have a uh, double odd number of nodes, it's not the same as having double it even uh, number of nodes. And again, this is uh, considering a case uh, where you start from a, a, a squeeze uh, a state of light uh, that's uh, uh, are experimentally given, and then you apply a linear optical duration. Uh, of course, uh, the idea is that we want to go uh, to this kind of quantum routing, also in complex networks. Uh, this is work in progress that we have now, and uh, a work in progress that is quite finished, but not yet out, uh, is to do routing also using measurements. So especially when you consider uh, complex, uh, uh, so CV uh, class, you can consider why shortening or just removing some particular nodes and doing it with a, a particular combination uh, uh, or looking at a particular multipath uh, uh, scheme in order to get uh, an advantage uh, for, uh, for example, for the uh, uh, entanglement concentration you can get in, in the EPR uh, state at the end. Um, very good. So this is uh, has been more or less the introduction on the idea of quantum complex networks, uh, staying Gaussian. Uh, now I go through the non-Gaussian part. So uh, so the non-Gaussian clusters. So uh, as you know, uh, what well, is interesting on, on Gaussian, of course, this is the, the topic of this uh, of this workshop. And uh, Nicola already presented uh, the. Uh, uh, let's say the, uh, the, the main uh, uh, experimental setup that we use in the lab for getting non-Gaussian states, uh, which is uh, uh, by, uh, uh, by using some frequency generation in order to select the mode from which we want to subtract uh, uh, a single photon. Uh, this is not the only one that we are considering, uh, so uh, this scheme is going to be improved uh, with the idea also to subtract more than uh, one photon and probably also to get a photon addition that is uh, more dependent uh, in the future. Uh, so I will start from it uh, by probably repeating some of the things that Nicola uh, told, uh, but that uh, I mean are quite interesting to introduce what I what I'm, uh, want to present uh, later on. So uh, as has been told, uh, well, uh, well, if you have uh, no click uh, on the sum frequency conversion, why nothing happen and uh, the, if you enter with a, a Gaussian state, you get out with a Gaussian state that can be fully characterized as far as you stay in the diagonal basis for the Hamiltonian, meaning that uh, I mean, if you have the basis of the squeeze state, you can recover the constructive linear function. And of course, if you get a click with a gate that corresponds to a particular mode, you can get a negative linear function. So it's exactly the, 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 the work that Nicola has been shown before. And uh, also, you can recast the thing by uh, uh, subtracting a photon from one node of a cluster. So again, recall that our cluster is just a combination of the uh, a linear combination of the modes that are uh, uh, diagonal from the Hamiltonian. So meaning that uh, to subtract a photon from one of the nodes, you have to send a linear combination uh, of this mode on the gate. And as Nicola shown, uh, have shown, uh, well, uh, there are two things. Uh, the first is that if you subtract, for example, if you just consider the simple square graph, when you subtract from one node, uh, so the maximum effect is on the other node, on, on the other corner. And the second point is that, uh, so the characterization of this quantum state has been done by considering the excess cortosis uh, of each mode uh, separately. Uh, no reconstruction of linear function has been done for this experiment because uh, it's quite hard. It's quite hard if you consider the normal way of doing, uh, 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 I mean, of getting information about linear function. Uh, which is uh, uh, done via uh, uh, quantum, quantum tomography uh, with maximum uh, likelihood process. So here you have four modes, and it's already something that uh, it's, it's not possible in the sense that it's uh, computationally too easy to solve for a maximum likelihood algorithm. 
even if you, I mean, at first, what is complicated is to directly get all the information that you need. Uh, so the experimental data, uh, it's, it's, it's a very long process. Uh, and you have to be sure that your experiment is stable enough. But even if you get there, uh, to get uh, the maximum likelihood uh, algorithm working, uh, it's, very, it's very hard. Um, so this is one of the first challenges here uh, that I'm going to, to tackle later on. Uh, which is how to get complete information of the, the non-Gaussian multimode quantum states, uh, because actually multimode quantum tomography is hard in this region. Uh, the second challenge uh, is uh, the uh, classification of uh, theoretical classification of non-Gaussian multimode quantum states when you start to have large number of non-Gaussian operations there. So, and also here you see, I mean, again, I'm pointing out this case because uh, as Nicola uh, told, so this case, uh, if you just get into theory, it's simple to explain why actually you get uh, the maximal effect on the other coin. But imagine that you have a larger cluster, very complex, and then you start to subtract even from a superposition of nodes. So, and, and, and then you have to look a little bit into the topology of this class and also actually, uh, if you go on the extreme regime where you can subtract many, many photons on, on this, on a very large cluster. So we know that this is a scenario where uh, you have the hardness of CD sampling. So this has been proved. Uh, but probably this is something in between that we can do uh, in the sense that we can try to classify uh, uh, these uh, uh, quantum states uh, uh, with some smart tool that are that is given by uh, complex network theory. So, I will start uh, by going for the first challenge. Uh, so the first challenge is to get the complete information. So the Wigner negativity uh, for uh, multi-mode states, non-Gaussian. And so the answer that we have found is to use the use of neural networks. So, um, so this is a work that has been done in collaboration with Universita Roma 3. Uh, and uh, so uh, with Marco Barbieri and uh, especially actually the, the driving force of this work uh, is uh, Valeria Cini, uh, that did a lot of work. And actually uh, the question that we asked to our neural network is uh, about the Wigner negativity. Uh, so um, I have to say that we are not the first using neural network to get information from quantum state of light. So, uh, in particular, here I'm pointing out two different work on uh, DV and CV uh, regime. Uh, but both of them have been really used to get the quantum tomography of the state. So the idea is that you want to encode uh, the, uh, the, at least the, the, the space state uh, uh, into a, a neural network in order to get an efficient answer about quantum tomography. What we do here is to directly ask the neural network if our state has a negative Wigner function. So we don't uh, go through the full reconstruction of the quantum states, but we just ask for the question that we want the answer. Uh, so how is the setting? Uh, so the idea is that we consider up to 10 mode states. So at the beginning, we have 10 squeeze modes that we can rearrange in any way. So meaning that well, I'm just showing a, 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 a network shape, meaning that I mean, they can undergo any uh, linear optics operation. And then uh, these states uh, can undergo uh, uh, either nothing or a subtraction in any superposition of modes or an addition on any superposition of modes. And then at the end of it, what you do is that you uh, measure uh, in a, I mean, uh, if you have 10 modes, you have 10 different homodyne measurements on three different uh, phases, and you get uh, 1,000, uh, 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 I mean, uh, a statistical 1,000 quadrature for each. Uh, so this basis could be a, a totally different one. So it's not given that this is the one that is used uh, that correspond to the shape uh, of, of the class in the sense of not measuring. So this homodyne detector is not even is going to measure this node, can just measure a superposition of the nodes, and then this one, another superposition of any node, and so on. So and this is repeat uh, 4,000 times. So what is interesting in this scenario is that uh, for up to 10 modes, uh, we have uh, the, the machinery that has been developed in the last year in our group, especially by uh, Mathieu Rochas, uh, for simulating what is going on. So we have analytical expression for the minimal uh, value of Wigner function in these cases. So we can use the data that we have for training a neural network. 
So what we do is that uh, each of the quadrature, I mean, each of the uh, statistic of the quadrature measure is a recast in five, uh, 15 beans uh, for each mode. They're given uh, to different uh, uh, nodes uh, in an input layer of a neural network. And then at the end, what we want to get is the answer. The Wigner is negative, yes or no. So the idea is that we use, uh, uh, so we have a, a kind of cross-validation procedure uh, we use as a training set 80% of the data, and then as the validation set 20% of the data. And then here you can see how the uh, validation loss and the accuracy, uh, so the, the, I mean, the first decrease and the second de increase uh, during the process. So here uh, you have the published results uh, for three different configurations, so considering three, five, and ten modes. Uh, and so at that time, what we have demonstrated is that you can get something like 90 per, uh, 95% of accuracy for three modes, 90, something more 90% for five, and then something in between 80 and 85 for 10. But I mean, we very recently were able to, to see that we can go far, and even the one of 10 modes can increase up to 95% by adapting, for example, the beaming that we choose here uh, in our uh, uh, in our feeding of the network. Uh, also, we uh, tested uh, the robustness uh, with different classes of state in the sense that we can use, uh, so the, the classes of state that we use here uh, is a uh, single photon add subtracted multimode state, squid, multimode squeeze state. But for example, you can use that for trading and then try to validate actually uh, by using, uh, for example, Fox stakes. And seems to work. So it seems to be a quite robust, uh, robust uh, uh, technique. Of course, it is really based on the fact that we are able to simulate uh, numerically uh, from the beginning and analytically the value of the linear function. But the fact that actually uh, uh, it's robust, even changing uh, the, the quantum states that we used uh, for, uh, for testing. Uh, it seems that probably we can uh, we can go uh, beyond also for the ten modes. For example, what we can do is try to uh, uh, to uh, simulate uh, 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 up to ten modes, feed uh, this this value, and try to test uh, something like multi-mode state of of even mode. Uh, of course, we did a comparison with the maximum likelihood. So here has been done uh, by considering just three modes, uh, which is the regime in which maximum likelihood can. Uh, can work. So the idea is that actually what we do with the maximum likelihood is to, re, uh, to recast uh, the, um, uh, well, the, the density matrix uh, on the FOC basis, uh, and then getting the Wigner negativity uh, 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 from, uh, from the parity operator. And uh, so what is interesting is that, of course, when you have large number of measurements, uh, maximum likelihood win is more accurate. But then what is interesting in our case, which is very interesting from the experimental point of view, is that uh, is the accuracy is really larger compared to maximum likelihood when you go to very low number of measurements. So here you go from uh, 10 to uh, 1,000, and we see that the 10 still, I mean, uh, the method is quite robust, robust. I mean, uh, to, to tell us, uh, quite good performance to tell us that uh, the, 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 the state is, uh, is really negative uh, or not. Okay, very good. Um, and and then uh, I uh, I will go to the uh, to the next part to the next challenge, which is the classification, the theoretical classification of non-Gaussian multimode quantum states uh, through complex network tools. Uh, so well, again here the answer is uh, so before it was used neural network. Here's the answer is to use uh, complex network tools. So this is a work that has been done in collaboration uh, with people at uh, Colorado School of Mines, so Lincoln Carr and uh, Bhuvanesh Sundar, that uh, now moved to uh, to Gila. And uh, so again, the idea is that these kind of states uh, are not totally easy to benchmark. Uh, so I, I will just start to debate to basis, basis again. So. Uh, what we do is to consider a graph, uh, which is a cluster state, uh, uh, where we have a structure, uh, which is the one of the imprinted network. So what we call the imprinted network uh, is the graph of CZ gates that are imposed to this, uh, uh, to this multi-mode state. Uh, so of course, there we already know that, uh, so this picture doesn't tell everything. So of course, the Gaussian correlation between quadrature uh, is known to go beyond the nearest neighbor. So uh, Nicola has been uh, speaking a little bit about it. 
Uh, also, we uh, already did uh, a lot of work. So again, uh, Mattia did a lot of work on this regime by looking what is going on uh, after photon subtraction on cluster states of regular shape, and especially by looking uh, a property, a local property, like for example, entanglement ligand negativity. Uh, so when you when you do the operation of photon subtraction, uh, so the correlation uh, 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 between quadrature go up to the second uh, order, uh, so the second uh, so the second neighbor. Uh, so this is what is happening also on uh, uh, entanglement being a negativity. They are reshaped, they are changed uh, uh, locally uh, up to the second neighbor. Um, but this is not the end of the story because that, of course, I mean, what has been uh, checked are regular uh, cluster shape. Uh, so we would like to be also in the case of complex cluster shape. And the second point is that we would like to have an idea of what is going on on quantum correlation between all the different nodes in the network. So look at two point correlation uh, in all the nodes of the network. So, we recast the general setting by considering an imprinted network, uh, 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 but uh, allowing us to have complex network shape. For example, here I'm considering uh, what is called a uh, watt strogatz network, which is one of the model of a small, uh, small world network. Uh, we consider 100 nodes, uh, and, and then we look uh, at what we call the emergent network. So we define a photon number correlation network in the multimode state, meaning that we look uh, at any two points, correlation between photon numbers. Uh, and then we rebuild, uh, we rebuild an adjacency matrix of this emergent network starting from this property. So why we do it? Do it? Well, at first, because we, why we choose actually photon number correlation. First, because in principle, these are two-point correlation that can be measured in principle in a quantum multiple experiment. Uh, the second point is that they contain up to the third order moment. So they are uh, sensitive to the non-Gaussian uh, let's say, properties of the state uh, that we really want to uh, understand uh, how, it change, uh, how it changes uh, when we consider, uh, 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 I mean, the single photon uh, subtraction. Uh, so then, uh, so here I'm just showing the emergent photon number correlation of the very same network before photon subtraction. So of course you have more link this is quite normal because, as I was telling before, actually uh, the quadrature correlation go beyond the, just the first uh, the, 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 the link that is given by the graphical structure of the class. Uh, and then uh, we subtract up to ten photon. So in this work, we started to subtract the photon locally. So we just uh, keep subtracting the, the photon on the same uh, nodes, uh, and we can just choose either the eigen connected node or a totally random node in the network. And then we look at the emergent photon number correlation, I change. So you can see that is not exactly the same as in the case of Gaussian. And of course, if you're going to want to have some kind of statistical behavior, uh, what we did uh, is to repeat 10, 10 other times uh, uh, this procedure of net of, of 100 modes and uh, get statistics for uh, degree L clustering that are two network measures that normally are used to classify complex networks. So the degree is the number of linear nodes. Uh, when you have uh, uh, adjacency metrics of 0, 1. So this is actually, we have, we have weighted a network. And the clustering uh, is uh, normally in uh, uh, 0, 1 adjacency metrics, normally you count as the number of uh, triangle divided, divided by the number of triplets. And uh, so uh, then you get the statistics for this uh, quantity. So this is what uh, uh, is the original one. So this is a typical degree statistic uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, from, uh, I mean, what Stroga's network that I'm considering. And, and then this is uh, the statistic of the emergent photon number correlation in Gaussian state case and in the non Gaussian case. Well, you see that you have a little bump in the non Gaussian cases. So the statistic is changed. The degree is increased. Uh, the average uh, value of the degree is increasing. And, and you have the second bump. And then you, you can try to go a little bit uh, more in detail. So what you can expect is that this bump uh, come uh, from, from the nodes that are closely related to the one from which you subtract the nodes. So you can expect that this come totally from the nodes at distance one. Uh, so we, we start to, to break up uh, the statistic according to the distance uh, from the subtraction node uh, 
uh, of the different nodes. So meaning that here I'm considering a different subgraph. Uh, so the one is the, no, uh, the subgraph of nodes that are at distance one. The two is the uh, subgraph of nodes that are at distance two, and then uh, uh, distance three from the points in which I'm doing the uh, 10 photon subtraction. And you see that, well, of course, you have a huge bump that come from the node at distance one, but not all of them contribute in the same way. So we started to look at it a little bit more into the statistic of uh, this uh, uh, subgraph at distance one. And then after a certain time, we discovered that the effect depends on the connectivity within the subgraph of the different nodes. So the nodes that are just connected to the node from which we do the, uh, we subtract a photon, a 10 photon, are very really affected, let's say, degree. While the one that have a lot of different connection with the other nodes in the same subgraph, well, actually are the one that got, uh, they get actually the larger effect on uh, the degree statistics. Uh, the, uh, 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 so the different group correspond to different connectivity with other nodes at the same distance. And this also explains why, for example, if you just consider a tree graph, or if you want is a Barabasi algorithm with uh, parameter m equal one, uh, is one that seems to be less affected about it because while you barely have node in the subgraph that they can, can have more than one connection. Uh, also, actually, uh, we tested different uh, uh, complex network models. So meaning that at the beginning, the imprinted network of CZ gates uh, in the cluster structure uh, is uh, uh, with other adhesion symmetrics that corresponds to different network models. So uh, this is, for example, again, is the vat strogat. So the vat strogat uh, is built by starting from a regular network. And then you start to rewind uh, the different uh, uh, connection, a different link, uh, meaning that to, if, you rewind, if the probability of rewiring is larger, you get, uh, um, I mean, uh, a more random network. So it's something that could be really between a regular and a random network by just changing this rewiring probability. And then uh, what we found, I found that uh, the effect that is given statistically, for example, on the degree uh, for the, uh, uh, photon, from the photon subtraction is larger, is the randomness is large. Uh, the second uh, classes that we have looked at are barabasi albert network, that are the, the network go with the preferential attachment. Uh, so for example, these are the model that has been used, one of the models that we used to describe the internet connection. And uh, so these networks are characterized by, uh, 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 let's say, um, uh, uh, hubs uh, or, I mean, uh, uh, community around a particular node. And then we can see a difference between the case in which we subtract from the uh, IGES connected node and the random node. And actually, the larger effect is subtracting from a random node. And this probably comes from the fact that the photon subtraction, uh, let, let's say, has a finite power as, uh, I mean, uh, entanglement distillation. So of course, this correlation is like entanglement distillation correlation. And then of course, if the node from which you subtract is connected to many other nodes, uh, like the hub, uh, the effect that you get is, is diluted, uh, let's say. While if you get a node randomly, uh, it's quite probable that in the uh, Barabasi Albert network, you get something that is not connected to many other nodes. And then there actually, you can have a larger effect uh, in terms of the uh, uh, correlation, how you're changing the correlation. Uh, so with this, I come to the, uh, to the end uh, of this part. So what we have been seen, uh, I mean, by using these uh, complex network tools uh, for a, a large uh, uh, non-Gaussian cluster state, is that the photon subtraction profoundly changes structure of correlation network when they're shaped as a complex network. So this comes from the fact uh, uh, also, of course, that uh, in, in general, in complex network model, the distance between nodes uh, is shorter uh, in general than in regular network, meaning that you have a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, nodes that are close to the nodes uh, that are uh, uh, one, the one from which I actually we subtract uh, the photon. Uh, then uh, we have seen that uh, the amount of randomness and inhomogeneity of the complex network shape can change the effect of this emergent correlation network in photon subtraction. 
So different models can affect in different way actually the results that we get. And uh, so we have kind of a general uh, rule in the sense that in general, photon subtraction uh, affect the bulk uh, of the cluster and degree distribution the same way. So meaning in a way you are increasing in any case the correlation uh, by doing this operation. But the structure of the tails of this, uh, uh, I mean, statistical distribution of degree and clustering really depends on the complex network structure of the imprinted network. It can be really different. And also, actually, what we have seen is the importance of the local network structure uh, around the subtraction points in order to look at this uh, non Gaussian uh, property uh, of, uh, of our network. And uh, actually, with this, I, I thank for your attention. <laughs>